of you to the city of Kolkata and to the ACM India Joint International Conference on Data Science and Management, COD SCOMAT 2019. As many of you are already aware, COMAD, modeled along the lines of ACM SIGMOD, is entering its 24th year. It has been a premier international database conference hosted in India. CODS was conceived in 2013 as a flagship conference for a new chapter of KDD that was started here, IKDD, the India chapter of KDD, which was also born in 2013. The first CODS conference was organized in 2014 at Delhi. Since then, CODS has steadily gained popularity and reputation as a meeting place for Indian and international data scientists in India. Since last year, CODS COMAD has been organized together. It's a moment of reckoning for the entire team as the background effort put in by them for about a year comes to the forefront today, hope you all will have an enriching experience while enjoying the fruits of their labor. This year, we received an unprecedented response from the community. As the registration count crossed 400, we were forced to close down the registration for logistic reasons, a big thank you to all of you over here for the phenomenal support that you have shown. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all our invited speakers who are here today and many more will be here over the next two days. It's my pleasure to thank all our sponsors. We are thankful to IKDD and ACM India, our institutional sponsors. We thank all our industry sponsors, Flipkart, TCS, Adobe, MX, Microsoft, IBM, Google, Hike, Rakuten, Intel, Amazon, Cisco, and NetApps. With the generosity of our sponsors, we have been able to support the travel for over 180 students from all over the country this year. With that, thank you. With that, let me wish you all days in the sessions as well as outside it as we bring to you a slice of Kolkata through food, music, and hospitality. Thank you all for being here. I now request our program chairs, Parag Singla and Raghu Krishnapuram, to give you more details about the program. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lipika. Um, so these are our sponsors. I guess Lipika talked about them. Uh, this is about the history Lipika has already mentioned, so let me go straight to the next slide. Uh, so this is our organizing committee. You can look at, there are about 20 plus of us who have been working hard for, for one year. As all of us know, that this takes a lot of effort to put something like, like this together. So there is general chairs, uh, Lipika and Sarajit, program chairs, me and Raghu, organizing chairs. So we had four tracks. I'll talk about them uh, in, in the next slide. And each track had its own chairs. We also had tutorials and chairs for that, proceedings, publicity, finance chairs, student travel grant uh, chairs, registration, and website chairs. Right? So, so it was a lot of effort, and I really want to thank all the members of the organizing committee to, to make it happen uh, successfully. Okay, there are some statistics about the papers that were submitted uh, to the conference. Uh, so as I said, there were four tracks. Uh, the research track was the main track of the conference. Industry track was a track where we were encouraging papers from the industry, where the first author was working in a corporate in industry. And the idea was to encourage papers where, which are actually being implemented or deployed in real life settings. Demo track, as the name suggests, was about demos, uh, the papers which also were accompanied by demonstrations. And Young Researcher Symposium was like a symposium where budding uh, young 
students, PhD students or young graduates would come up and present their work, which could potentially be ongoing with a lot of potential. Uh, we had a large program committee, a sort of reviewers, about 160 reviewers we had. I'll again talk about uh, details of the reviewers we had. In number of submissions, we had 95 submissions for the research track, 22 for uh, industry, 29 for demo, and 53 for uh, young researcher symposium. So total of about 200 papers were submitted to the conference. Uh, out of those for research track, we had 24 acceptances. 15 were research, uh, 15 were oral presentations, and 9 will be presented as posters. Uh, 8 were accepted in the industry track, 12 in the demo, and 27 in the YRS. If you look at the acceptance rate, I, I, I could boast that you know acceptance rates that we have, especially for research and industry, are, are comparable to any top tier conference in the world, which is, which is I think, a great thing. And I should add that you know, we, we were very scrupulous in terms of deciding and making sure any paper that makes to the conference is of high quality. Uh, for demo and young researchers, Symposium, we were a little bit uh, lenient in the sense that we want, really wanted to encourage young students, especially for YRS, to come up and present their work. Uh, therefore, the acceptance rates are a little bit higher. Uh, overall, in proceedings, uh, we have about 56 uh, papers. Uh, note that uh, not every paper, the research and industry, track every paper which was accepted is also part of proceedings. But for Demo and Young Researchers Symposium, YRS, we allowed papers to be presented at the conference, but the authors had an option to opt out so that they could decide to send their work to some other conference. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, about authors and PC, some more statistics. So we had 500 distinct authors uh, from all over the country. We also had about 10% authors who had foreign non-Indian affiliations, which I think is, is a very good thing. Uh, program committee reviewers, we had 160 plus distinct PC members and about 20% of them had foreign affiliations. Review process, uh, I think we had a, I briefly mentioned, we had a very, very rigorous review process. Each paper in the research and industry track was reviewed by at least three reviewers, and each of the track chairs uh, looked at the borderline papers very carefully, and whenever required, they went and sought out additional reviews. For demo track and YRS, we had at least two reviews for each paper, and once again, wherever there was a requirement, we went to the additional reviewers and, and made sure that the decision we make is the right one. Uh, okay, I'll now request Raghu to come up and uh, present other highlights. Thank you. Okay, good morning again and uh, welcome uh, to this conference. Uh, it's really a privilege and honor to be one of the program co-chairs. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a few highlights of the conference. Uh, so we, this year, keeping up with the tradition of having many uh, keynotes and invited talks, uh, also have many of them. There are four keynote talks, uh, and there are one on each day. The last day has actually two keynote talks. And there are six invited talks in the research track, and there are four invited talks in the industry track. So one of the changes we made this year was actually to um, enhance the industry, industry track, because last year we did not get a lot of submissions, but this year actually we've, the industry track chairs have done a very good job, and we really have a lot more uh, presence. So that's really very encouraging. And overall, actually, the sponsorship and everything else has gone up this year, as uh, Lipika pointed out. Uh, actually, this conference is surging ahead, and we really think you know, it will be in a very good position in the, uh, in the future. So uh, in terms of the tutorials, there are four tutorials. Uh, and uh, I think all of them you will uh, see. They're all very contemporary topics. and. Um, so ho I hope you'll take advantage, advantage of these uh, tutorials. And we also organized two panel discussions uh, this time. Uh, one is part of the industry track, uh, and we, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, uh, just in a couple of minutes. And uh, one of the new sessions we introduced this year uh, is this last one, which is called the Top Tier Conference Papers. So the idea here is that actually in India we don't have many uh, truly top tier conferences happening. So uh, the audience here does not get to listen to the best work in the world, so to speak. But uh, authors from India have been regularly presenting at these very top conferences. So <clears throat> we wanted to encourage uh, such um, authors to come and present their work here so that other people can listen to them and benefit from that. So that's the idea here. And actually, CODS, uh, COMAD has had this tradition in the past of inviting eminent people and talk about their work, which may have been presented in other ven venues also. But this is kind of 
a similar idea where it's formally organized as a session and we hope that uh, this session, this kind of uh, uh, session could be expanded in the future if it's very popular this time. So um, again, as I mentioned, there are two panels. Uh, one of them is part of the industry track and that's called uh, Challenges in Developing and Deploying AI ML Solutions at Scale. And this is particularly um, about the kinds of problems people face in industry. When you talk about AI, it sounds very simple, but in reality, it's not so easy to deploy these solutions. So uh, we have some really interesting, uh, we're going to have uh, some very interesting discussions on this tomorrow. So I would invite all of you to join this uh, industry panel. Um, and also there is another panel, which is, about the AI strategy for India, because uh, many countries have actually published their AI strategy, and India is one of those countries that still working on it. There is actually a discussion paper that was released by Niti Aayog uh, earlier, actually in the middle of last year. And uh, so, but it's not really a strategy, it's just a discussion paper, and we have to evolve a strategy out of that. So this panel was intended to get some uh, opinions and viewpoints about what could be India's strategy for AI. So that's, uh, this is going to happen on the last day, on Saturday. So again, I hope all of you will be there to participate because it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, and then uh, just another announcement. Uh, so we are going to have best paper awards this time and also best demo and special mention awards. Uh, there is a best paper award for research and industry tracks. So one best paper in each track and we have actually invited a panel of judges for each one of those, and these are not really the original reviewers of the paper. So the process was that uh, we shortlisted some papers out of all the papers that were accepted uh, based on the reviewers' comments, and this, these shortlisted papers will be again re-evaluated by a panel of judges, and we will uh, use their scores finally to, um, uh, to decide what should be the best paper. So this is going to happen in the next couple of days. And all of these awards will be announced uh, tomorrow evening, uh, just before the banquet. So I hope all of you will be there for the award ceremony. And uh, so as I said, there's going to be four uh, types of awards. One, of the, one for the research track, one for the industry track, and there's one for the demo track. And also for the Young Researchers Symposium, we are going to have three special mention awards. So three uh, presentations of papers will be selected for special mention. And so these are the four types of awards we are having this year. Of course, this is not the first time that COSCOMED has had these awards. They've had them in the past. Uh, so I hope all of you will be coming to this ceremony. And these awards actually uh, carry a cash prize as well as uh, certificates. Right. Okay, so I just want to flash the program very briefly. Here, uh, I don't know, people in the back may not be able to see this very well, but we have a very, very <laughs> packed program, very tight schedule because uh, there are so many things happening. So <laughs> we had to create many parallel sessions to accommodate all the events. And so you do have a lot of choice. So I hope that people will really make use of all these options and uh, will find something interesting all the time. So the general, uh, uh, plan here is that in the morning we will always have a keynote in the beginning and then uh, we'll have an invited talk following that. Today there is no invited talk following the keynote because of the inaugural ceremony and also the registration took some time so we've delayed the, uh, the inaugural ceremony. So, uh, but every other day there is actually a keynote followed by an invited talk and then we have to unfortunately um, uh, partition this hall into three smaller rooms, so that will actually take time. So I really hope that all of you will cooperate, and in fact, all the uh, presenters especially. Uh, please finish up on time. Uh, please use only the allotted time, and please don't go beyond, because we have to really synchronize all three parallel sessions, and they have to start and end at the same time because of the restrictions imposed by the logistics. So <laughs> there will be a coffee break right after the um, after this, and actually more details will be explained by uh, Indrajit in a minute. But uh, the general uh, plan here, as I said, the schedule is that uh, after lunch, we typically will have again parallel sessions, but today we have a tutorial and uh, industry track. Uh, and then uh, after the break, tea break, again we have invited talks. 
so, and the afternoon is a little bit different on each day, but the morning is very similar. And then, uh, so each morning after the invited uh, talk, we are going to have three parallel sessions. The research track and the YRS will be there on every single day. And the third track is going to be different on each day. The first track, first day it is demo, the second day it's industry, and the third day it is the top tier session. So, um, and uh, tomorrow evening, please don't miss the <laughs> banquet. And that's going to happen here, right here. So everything is happening right here. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, all I wanted to say for now, and I now invite uh, Indrajit to say a few more words about the logistics and if you have any other questions about the venue and things. So hello everyone, and welcome to COD's Comat 2019 on behalf of the Local Organization Committee. Uh, so I am Indrajit, and my co-Local Organization Chair is Professor Nobendu Chaki. He's right at the back somewhere, true to his character. He did not want to come on stage. Um, anyway, so I, I really envy the program chairs for more reasons than one. But right now, I envy them because they get to tell you about all the fantastic program that they have put together. And I get to tell you about the dry logistics and the rules. Yes, there are rules. But please bear with me, because these rules are going to help you get around in the next three days. Okay. So as Raghu already explained, so we are right here in Bern, right? And as you can see on your screen, everything is literally under one roof for this conference, fortunately or unfortunately, OK? So right now, we are in Bern. And this is sort of the plan for general plan for all days. All the keynotes, invited talks are going to happen right here, OK? And then we are going to split up into three parallel sessions, as the program requires. So this one, where I'm standing right now, is burn three. Right at the other end is burn one. The one at the middle is burn two. Okay? So the sponsor booths are right across the fire on the other side. Right? So we would like to thank the sponsors again. The program, this conference, would not have been possible without their support. Do visit them. They have interesting things to tell you about. So registration, as you already know, is right at the other corner. Very important. You must have gotten your food coupons during your registration. Do hold on to those. Very important. Unless you're you know, willing to go hungry during lunch or banquet, you need your food coupons. Okay? Rule number one. Uh, second, so lunch, coffee is going to be at the foyer outside on all days, right? And the highlight today is, as Raghu explained, the poster session that's in the evening, starting at 6. That will also be right here, OK? And um, so all poster presenters, do keep in mind that you have to get your posters ready by 6. And you do have poster numbers allotted to you. OK, poster board numbers. So when you come in, find out your poster board number and go straight to that poster board. OK? So the highlight for tomorrow, that's the second day, Jan 4th, is, of course, the banquet. And we have also arranged for a cultural program. There will be a live band performing during the banquet, so don't miss that. Again, there's a banquet coupon. Please don't lose your banquet coupons. Ah, so there's. You can also sign up for additional banquet coupons. If you have guests, you can go right to the website. And there's a link there where you can sign up. But do that by today, because for logistic reasons, we have to inform the hotel ahead of time. Okay. On the topic of you know, high tea and banquet, if you did not already know, Kolkata is very well known for its food. Okay. It's well known for a few other things as well. So if you're wondering what to do during your, your stay in Kolkata, do go to the Kolkata page on our website. There are plenty of suggestions on what you might do during your time here. And if you're wondering how to get around, so please, um, you, you can, you're welcome to go to the hotel travel desk, and, and, and they'll help you get around. Okay. And of course, uh, there's much more information on our website. There are many volunteers around. If you need help at any time, look out for green, green lanyards like this, right? Very noticeable. So those are your volunteers. And I am one. Okay? 
Um, and so as, as Raghu mentioned, right, we are extremely happy and pleased to have been able to support so many uh, students uh, traveling from across the country. Um, however, there are a few rules for the student travel grant awardees, so listen carefully, right? The buses that leave from the places where you're staying are going to leave on time. If you miss those buses, you are on your own. And it's the same when you're going back. There are buses. Make sure you know the bus timings. Don't miss the bus. If you do, again, you're on your own, okay? The bus will not wait for you. And yes, there is a sign-on sheet. Make sure you sign those sign-in sheets every day, all three days, okay? Another rule for you. And again, I would like to mention that while the sponsors make the event possible, it is the volunteers who make the event happen. And we are very, very thankful to all the volunteers who have supported us over the last few days and are going to support us over the next few days. So a thank you, big thank you to all of you. While we want you to enjoy the conference, please do not forget your volunteer duties. Make some time for that. And finally, our apologies for this. One thing that we have not been able to arrange for, for various reasons, is internet connectivity at the conference. However, for guests staying at the hotel, you will have connectivity, unfortunately not here, okay? But you will have connectivity at, in your rooms, of course, at the lobby, at the 6th floor cafeteria. And again, our apologies for this. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there and we'll take questions if you have any. But anyway, I'm going to be around, all the volunteers are going to be around. Any issues, you please come and approach any of us. Okay, thank you. Another, another, I think, very important rule, since we are under one roof, as I explained, it's, it's useful to know the security, the emergency exits, all of that stuff around this place. So I'll, I'll request the security officer to just come in and give you a two minute overview. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Shomna Chatterjee, working here as a uh, security executive. Wishing you all a happy new year. So right now, without delaying much, so I'll take you uh, through a short briefing. Right now, we are situated at the third floor of this building. It's the burn area. Along with, you'll find the Zurich, Basel, and Geneva. That is located just beyond this uh, burn. You can get the two exit points right over here that will lead to the assembly point. You can see the signage right placed over there. In case of emergency, I hope there will be no emergency, but in case of emergency, you can use this staircase and uh, land up to the assembly point that is situated just in front of our time office where all our security staffs and uh, other representatives will be there to help you out. Now you can find there is a herb garden just next to the registration desk. That is the designated smoking zone for if anyone smokes over here. So I would request that while going to that side, do not take the cups and plates or over there because we got a mall attached to it. So if anything happens like uh, falling off a cups or dishes that can lead to an accident which may cause a trouble. So you can smoke over there and attached to that you can see that the mall access door is there. In case of emergency that route can be used for, for emergency exit. Now it's a non-smoking hotel so those who are staying in the room I would request not to smoke over there. Your designated smoking area will be the sixth floor Cafe Suisse outer deck. Otherwise, there is the lobby. You can, uh, there is a sm uh, small cabana you can see over there. You can smoke over there, so it will be a hassle-free operations. So right now, we got an em emergency number that is six. From the landline, if you dial six, apart from any of the calls that the operator will take, that will be the first call that land up to the operator, and we will be there to assist you. Apart from that, we got our 24 into 7 security staffs, as well as the CCTV operator, as well as the fireman. So all the installation has been done, so hoping that uh, all three days you will have a safe and uh, happy conference. Wishing you all, again, a happy new year from my end. Thank you. So with this, we move on to our first session, first, invited, uh, first keynote talk. It's my great pleasure to invite Professor Milin Tambe from University of Southern California. Milin Tambe is Helen N. and Embed H. Jones Professor in Engineering and Founding 
of co founding co-director of Center for AI in Society at USC. He is a fellow of AAAI uh, and ACM and recipient of a number of awards, including Ichkai John McCarthy Award, which was conferred on him very recently, AAAI Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award, ACM SIGI Autonomous Agents Research Award, Informs Wagner Prize, the Risk Prize of the Military Operations Research Society, the Christopher Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award, International Foundation for Agents and Multi-Agent Systems Influential Paper Award. He is also a recipient of meritorious commendation from the U.S. Coast Guard and L.A. Airport Police, as well as U.S. Federal Air Marshal Service. Uh, Milind has also co-founded a company where his director of research, uh, which is called Avata Intelligence. He received his PhD from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, and I know him personally for a couple of years, two or three years, and I know he has a great passion for applying AI and ML uh, for the society has done a lot of work in US and also he has been interacting with governments and, and academicians and all corporates in India so that AI can be useful for solving social problems. Right? So he's going to talk about how to use AI and multi-agent systems for social good and without further ado I'll in invite Milin. Thank you. Thank you uh, Parag for a very kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you for all your flexibility and very warm hospitality. So with the recent progress in AI and multi-agent systems, it is now important to direct these advances towards societal benefit. I'll focus on three areas, public safety and security, conservation and public health. Viewing these societal problems as multi-agent systems, there's a key research problem that cuts across these areas. How to optimize the use of limited intervention resources when interacting with other agents in these domains. And I'll focus on the use of computational game theory as a means of trying to address this problem. With respect to public safety and security, we have a large number of targets to protect but limited security resources. How to schedule or plan or allocate these resources taking into account a watchful adversary? We've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States and internationally. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect but limited range of resources. Here we've contributed a new model called Green Security Games. Concrete example is work we've been doing in Uganda with Uganda Wildlife Authority. By exploiting traces of where poachers have set snares in the past, we are able to predict where poachers may set traps or snares in the future. And for the past several years, have been able to remove a large number of these traps and even get poachers arrested. The work is being extended towards trying to prevent illegal fishing and illegal logging. Third, with respect to public health, we have limited number of social work resources, social workers. Concrete example here is work we've been doing in homeless shelters in Los Angeles. Big challenge is informing homeless youth about dangers of HIV, AIDS. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we've shown that our influence maximization algorithms that are based on the idea of games against nature are far more effective in spreading this information compared to traditional approaches. We are extending this work trying to prevent tuberculosis in India and other health-related challenges. All of this work is only possible because of the interdisciplinary partnerships with different governmental and non-governmental organizations. To that end, we have really patrolled with the US Coast Guard on their boats in the port of New York. We have patrolled with conservation agencies in forests in Malaysia. Our students spend time in homeless, working with homeless shelter officials. We've visited with TB clinics in India. This immersion is important in order to collect the right kind of data on the basis of which we can do predictive models. These predictive models, for example, may tell us uh, which cases are high risk, predict which cases are high risk versus low risk. Following that, our prescriptive algorithms, our game theoretic algorithms may come into play to figure out how to apply our intervention resources. But we are also keenly interested in deploying these algorithms in the field. This is not only important because we're interested in the social impact, because this is how we can truly understand limitations of our models and data. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about the three areas I mentioned. 
I'll talk, start with public safety and security. This is the last 10 years of work that we've done. Public safety and security is work that was ten, from 10 years ago. It's been continuing, but I'll spend a little less time on that and focus more time on the more recent work that we've done in conservation and public health. All of the work uh, I'll present is published in AAAI, Ichikai, or AMAS of that year. And so if you want to find uh, simulation results, you'll find them in those papers. In this talk, I will focus exclusively on real-world evaluations. If you want to find more information, here's a list of uh, recent edited books, including the recent ones on AI and social work and AI and conservation. If you happen to purchase these books, then from the royalties, I can take my students out to a nice dinner. <laughs> but we really have to thank our PhD students and postdocs. And so to that end, I'm gonna show pictures of the lead PhD student or postdoc in the top right-hand corner of the slide on which their work will be shown. So with this, let's start with public safety and security. Events of 9-11 were devastating for all of us. Having grown up in Mumbai, I'm familiar with the attacks that have happened on Mumbai. One particular attack on 11 July 2006 was quite close to home. Bombs went off on local trains in Mumbai and for several hours, my mother was unreachable. Fortunately, luckily, she got off the train just before the bombs went off. But this raised the importance of public safety and security in my mind. So then when the chief of airport police at the LAX airport approached us in the fall of 2006, to improve security at the LAX airport, we were all ears. His concern was threats like these, somebody driving a suicide truck, such as what happened in Glasgow in 2007. The challenge is that there are eight inbound roads at the airport, eight terminals. How to optimize the use of limited security resources? The problem for us was could we propose game theory as a means of doing this optimization? Could we convince different homeland security scientific advisory committees that this was the right approach? Could we convince our AI reviewers that this was the right approach given that leaders in the field were claiming that game theory was simply not practical enough for applications? Could we convince sergeants on the ground that this was the right approach? And in fact, that's what we decided to do. We proposed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games, which has two key aspects for tractability. First, it's a game played on targets where payoffs are based on whether targets are covered or not. And it's a Stackelberg leader follower formulation. I'm gonna present this using the simple example of a two by two game, where we have a defender trying to present, uh, protect two targets. There's only one police unit and one adversary. If the defender tries to always protect terminal one, an adversary conducting surveillance will attack terminal two. The adversary gets a positive reward of one, the police get a negative reward minus one. If as a result, the defender switches and always try to protect terminal two, an adversary will attack terminal one, the defender again gets a negative reward. Any deterministic strategy the adversary could defeat. If the police were to use a mixed strategy, a randomized strategy, 60% of the time they're at terminal one, 40% of the time they're at terminal two, an adversary conducting surveillance will only know that the police are there at terminal one 60% of the time, at terminal two 40% of the time. What they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. These kinds of games are called Stackelberg games because defender commits first to a randomized strategy. The adversary conducts surveillance and then can respond. We are optimizing the use of limited security resources. We are not guaranteeing 100% security because in the real world, there is no such thing. We are increasing the cost and uncertainty to an adversary in coming with a plan of attack. Our contributions are, of course, in solving massive scale games. So here's how the armor system at LAX worked. We start with a game matrix, and I'll come to how we came up with the payoffs in just a minute. We then feed it into a mixed integer program that generates defender mixed strategy. The probability that there's a canine patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 2, 5, and 6 is 0.17. Probability there's a canine patrol at terminals 3, 5, and 7 is 0.33, and so on. And then we sample 
from this distribution to generate an actual schedule. For example, send team one to terminal two, team three to terminal five, and team five to terminal six at 8 a.m. At 9 a.m., do something different, and so on. Now let's look at how we generated the mixed integer program. We are trying to maximize defender expected utility. Rij here refers to the reward to the defender if the defender takes a strategy I and the adversary takes a strategy J. Xi is the probability with which defender takes a strategy I. For example, X1 is the probability there's a dog on terminal one and a dog on terminal two. X2 is the probability there's a dog on terminal two and a dog on terminal three. For every single combination of assigning defender resources to targets, we are going to generate a probability variable. This is sufficient for the scale of problem we faced at the LAX airport, but it's going to face problems when we scale up, as we will shortly see. We model the fact that the adversary gets to conduct surveillance of the mixed strategy and then respond, and this is modeled by a best response function for the adversary. Now let's look at where the payoffs come from for, from this game matrix. The threat at LAX was somebody driving a suicide truck into one of the terminals. If such an attack were to be successful, the loss to the defender would be the loss of human lives that would occur. We had from the airport detailed numbers on how many people are present at different terminals at different times of the day, and this is how we could generate the payoffs. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about work we did with the U.S. Coast Guard, and there a team of researchers has gone to different ports in the, in, in the, in the states for every target, for every method of attack. The how many people would die if such an attack were to succeed and what would be the direct economic consequences on the basis of which we generated payoffs. In short, there's a lot of work that has already been done in generating these payoffs and that's how we build our payoff matrices. Of course, these numbers are not perfect, so we have to be able to handle uncertainty. We've done enormous amounts of work trying to handle this uncertainty. I'm not gonna have, be able to have time to go into this today. But if all of, with all of this work in place. Armor was operational at the LAX airport starting in 2007. It's the first ever application of computational game theory for operational security. Soon there was news in the news, local news media and reports of captures. For example, in January of 2009, all these weapons were captured going into the airport. This obviously made the LAX police very happy and somebody at the Los Angeles City Hall noticed because we got, me and my students were very honored to receive commendations from the city of Los Angeles for the work we had done. Up to that point, we had been very fortunate to have received best paper awards, but this was a very different honor and this was very thrilling. Errol even went to United States Congress and talked about the improvements that he had made, including the work we did with him. LAX is safer today than it was 18 months ago. A team of research led by Dr. Malen Tambay worked with our department to develop armor. This software randomizes our vehicle checkpoints along airport access roads and the deployment of our explosives detection canine teams throughout the airport. And so there was news media, for example, Newsweek saying that armor throws a digital cloak of unity. This of course led my colleagues at the next AMAS conference to ask me if we were working on a cloaking device. <laughs> but this got the attention of the Federal Air Marshal Service. This is from our first visit to the Freedom Center, the home of the Federal Air Marshals. Right at the entrance is a memorial to 9-11 victims. Rubble from the Pentagon, pieces of the plane that crashed into the World Trade Center, debris from the World Trade Center. And we were really motivated that whatever the Federal Air Marshals ask us to do, we should really do that. There challenge was how to assign air marshals to flights. With thousands of international flights a day, the strategy space was 10 to the power 41. If you just feed this input into armor, it quietly dies running out of memory. So we needed a different approach to scale up, but to understand that, let's understand why uh, this problem is so difficult to solve. This is the game in the normal form. Along the rows are all the different ways in which we can assign air marshals to flights. We could assign air marshals to flights 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 4, 1, 2, 5, etc. The adversary could attack any of the flights and those are along the act, those are the strategies of the adversary along the columns of the matrix. There's 10 to the power 41 different rows because there's 10 to the power 41 different ways we can assign air marshals to these thousand flights. 
which means there's 10 to the power 41 xi variables in our mixed integer program, which means this program cannot run. It cannot run, but if we could make it run, what we would find is that most of these xi variables are zero. The support set size is small, and in fact, we can prove that a security game with t-targets, the optim optimal solutions exist where support set size is only t plus one, which means that if we could know in advance that many of these x, indeed we know in advance many of these xi variables could be zero, if we could know which ones they are and remove them from the game matrix, we would get a smaller game matrix, which if we would solve, we would get the exact same solution as the larger game matrix. And this is the insight on which we've developed a ex new exact algorithm for scale up. This idea is incremental strategy generation, and it's the first such algorithm for these Tackleberg security games. We start with a small game matrix initialized with a small number of pure strategies for the defender. And then there's a slave problem that using LP duality theory tells us what's the next best pure strategy to add. And we iterate in this fashion until we converge. And the convergence will be to a global optimal, but we may only have a game matrix with 1,000 pure strategies for the defender instead of 10 to the power 41. This is how we've built IRIS, which is used by the federal air marshals to assign air marshals to flights. If you've been on a US air carrier, United, Delta, American, and so on internationally, whether there was an air marshal or not on your flight may have been decided by IRIS. In 2012, we were very honored to have our work again mentioned in United States Congress in a committee hearing and receive the certificate of appreciation from the Federal Air Marshals. The Federal Air Marshals then introduced us to the Coast Guard, the US Coast Guard, and for them we built a system called PROTECT for improving patrolling in different ports in the United States. You can see ARMOR and PROTECT, these are acronyms. We have spent enormous amounts of time trying to come up with good acronyms for our programs. So PROTECT helped improve patrolling in different ports in the United States, Boston, New York, Los Angeles. A key different challenge, though, was patrolling around the Staten Island Ferry, carrying 60,000 passengers a day, a threat. Somebody may ram a suicide boat into the ferry, and therefore the Coast Guard do these patrols. These are our algorithms that have completely changed the way the Coast Guard do these patrols around the Staten Island Ferry. I'm going to use this example to demonstrate a new approach to scale up in Stackelberg security games, which is this marginal strategy. So, I'm going to use a discrete space-time representation. There is a Journal of AI Research article in 2013 that extends this to continuous time. Here we have three locations, A, B, and C, three and C, three time points, 5, 10, and 15 minutes. The dashed lines show all the ways in which the boats can travel. For example, the ferry can go from C to B to A, it was shown by the green line. The patroller can leave from location B, go to location C, then go back to location B as shown by the red line. The patroller can protect the ferry right next to it. In fact, there are many different routes the patroller can follow. Now the question is how to randomize over these routes, and we can do this using the same armor style linear program that we saw before where each route is a variable. What this would mean though is there's n to the power t different variables because you have n locations and t time points. This again has difficulty scaling up. If instead of taking each route as a variable, we use a marginal representation where we take marginal probabilities over each segment of the route. So for example, we combine this flow on these two segments, red and brown, and combine them into a single probability flow variable. We take these two brown segments together, combine them into a single probability flow variable. Now we have this marginal representation where there's n squared multiplied by t variables, which does scale up, and from there we can extract the probabilities of the routes that we really want. So this is how we generated patrol routes for different ports and around the Staten Island Ferry. The Coast Guard were happy with the results in a surprise commendation ceremony in the Atlantic Area Headquarters. We were honored to receive meritorious commendation from the commandant of the Coast Guard, and again honored to have our work mentioned in a committee hearing in the United States Congress. We're working with the University of Southern California to uh, utilize game theory as a way of optimizing and scheduling our patrol. It makes it harder for somebody to anticipate where the patrols will be. So we've... Um, continued this work forward. 
checking people who travel without tickets on trains in Los Angeles. We are very thrilled to see many different applications springing up in different parts of the world. In Singapore, it's patrolling the ports, traffic, sa traffic safety, interdicting drug smuggling, and many other applications. And there's a lot of research going on in many different research groups. If you're interested in this topic, there's a whole conference on GameSec. Every single talk, Game Theory for Security. If you want to attend that, uh, so it's something I'm very excited by. Some of the applications they look at include cybersecurity, wildlife security, which I'll talk about next, as well as infrastructure security and so forth. Before I go on to wildlife security, though, let me talk a bit about evaluation. The question we ask here is how well have we optimized the use of our limited securities compared to traditional approaches, including human schedulers or simple random? And we've done lots of this work evaluating in the lab, doing scheduling competitions, field evaluation. I'm going to be able to talk to you to show you a few of these instances, but there's a lot more. So let's start with these patrols in the port of Boston done by the US Coast Guard before Protect was deployed. Along the x-axis are different days of the week and along the y-axis how frequently different targets were visited. For example, the green line at the top is how frequently a particular target was visited on day one of the week, on day two, on day three, and so forth. And every single line represents a different target, how frequently that target was visited. There's two key points to note. There's very few patrols on day two. This is a good day. This was a good day to attack the port of Boston. Secondly, all the lines crisscross, meaning that sometimes a target is more important. Next day, it's not as important. Third day, again, it becomes important. But targets actually don't change their importance from day to day. This is how patrols look like after Protect was deployed. The more important targets are visited more, the less important targets are visited less. There is no dip on day two. On any given day where the boat will go remains unpredictable, but the more important targets are visited more. If you look at it from the perspective of defender expected utility, there's a 350% improvement from before to after armor was uh, protect was deployed. The Federal Air Marshal Service did a scheduling competition, human versus machine. Their conclusion that the game theoretic approach was just superior. And if you think about a human scheduler trying to schedule air marshals on flights, thousands of flights, duty hours, off hours, trying to make sure that the air marshal is not left in London and brought back and so forth, and we ask them, hey, take into account all the risks of the different flights and be random, it's extremely difficult for a human being. And a game theoretic approach just happens to be better. And there's actually a US government accountability office report that points out weaknesses of human schedulers. We also did this competition. 90 officers had to be scheduled in a counterterrorism exercise on trains in Los Angeles. We asked a team of human schedulers, experts, to schedule these officers, and they took two days to come up with a schedule. And then we had our software competing with it. We had external observers who didn't know who had generated which patrols that were stationed at different train stations in Los Angeles trying to evaluate these patrols along 12 different questions. And their conclusion, the game theoretic patrols were just superior. So the human beings took a lot longer to come up with these schedules, two days, and in, in the end performed worse than the game theoretic approach. We also had a competition trying to catch fare evaders on trains in Los Angeles. For 21 days, our patrollers went out patrolling. They were given a game theoretic schedule. And on the other hand, the com competition was a baseline approach. The question is, who could catch more fair evaders? And the conclusion, game theoretic approach was superior, 60% more captures of fair evaders. And on and on it goes. This is a numbers of captures at the checkpoints at the LAX airport. You can see there's a five-fold increase from before to after armor was deployed in terms of captures of guns, drugs, and so forth. All of this is pointing out that a game theoretic approach appears superior in optimizing the use of limited resources compared to traditional approaches. Where we are taking this first threat screening games, this is work we have been doing with the US Transportation Security Administration to improve checking of passengers going into airports. We've published a number of papers. If you are going through a US airport and you get delayed, please don't blame us. Our software is not yet in use. 
We are also trying to push cybersecurity, and so this is cyber deception games that we've been developing. So let me now turn to the second topic, which is conservation. This is work done jointly with Dr. Andy Plumtree, who's a conservation biologist. Before we go on, let's think about what it is that we are fighting for. These are my pictures from my visit to Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. There's absolutely th wonderful, magnificent wildlife there. But there's threats to this wildlife, snares or traps that are used to kill and maim animals in the thousands. Thousands of traps laid every year. Question for us is how to use limited ranger resources, optimize the use of limited numbers of rangers. To that end, we've contributed a new model called Green Security Games. The beginning here is that consider a national park such as the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. We divide up the park in terms of grid squares, one kilometer by one kilometer grid square, where each grid square is a target. This can then be proposed as a security game for the rangers to patrol. Unfortunately, the situation here is that the adversary is not fully strategic, fortunately or unfortunately. In fact, what we are facing are multiple boundedly rational poachers, which means that they are not going to provide us this best response that we were looking for, but instead, they conduct a lot of attacks, and from that we can learn their boundedly rational response. So we learn this function GI, which is the probability of finding a trap or a snare in a cell I, based on range of patrol frequency and features of the cell. And then we can optimize our patrols based on having found this probability for each grid square. So attention now shifts to finding this probability of finding a snare in each cell. So you're trying to learn this function GI as a function of distance to roads and rivers and other features that we have, as well as range of patrol frequency. And we have data from past 12 years from Uganda. One complication we face, though, is that when the rangers report that they did not find a snare in a particular grid cell, we can't be certain because they may not have walked enough. If they just walked a little bit more, we could have found a snare. So our negative instances are not as trustworthy. To handle this, we instituted this new observation-aware ensemble model. So we create multiple filtered data sets. So in one filtered data set, we throw away all negative instances where the patrollers have walked less than one kilometer. Because we say that those negative instances we don't trust. And we train a classifier for that. And then we throw away for this other filter data set where the filtering is set at two kilometers, all negative instances patrollers have walked less than two kilometers, train a classifier for that. And so we generate a lot of these classifiers, and then at test time, we use an ensemble. So if we get a test instance where the patrollers walked one kilometer, we fire these two classifiers. If patrollers have walked two kilometers or more, these three classifiers come into play and so on. So we did a lot of evaluation in the lab. We showed that our model is far superior to traditional machine learning approaches, but this was simply insufficient for our collaborators, Wildlife Conservation Society and Uganda Wildlife Authority. They wanted demonstrations in the field. So we generated in 2016 these two nine square kilometer areas where there have been infrequent patrols and there were no previous hotspots. So the green dots are where we ask the patrollers to patrol. You can see that they do not overlap with the red dots where snares or traps had been found in the past. So we are not just asking patrollers to go where they had gone before to find more stuff. We are saying there's new areas, you haven't patrolled them before, you're going to find snares here. We did this before a conference deadline, which means that if we, go, we find snares, we are going to be able to publish a paper. If there's no snares, there's no paper, there's gonna be delays in the PhD and so forth. And with this, we sent out patrollers in the field. Every day they would go out and send us an email as to what happened. First day, nothing happened. Second day, nothing happened. And so we're like, okay, is anything going to happen? And then one day suddenly they f said they found a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. We were too late for this elephant, but at least our machine learning system had guided us to the right spot. Poachers were active in these areas. Then came good news. 
a whole elephant snare roll was found and removed. So poachers were active in this area, they were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, we removed this set of snares, and potentially saving lives of many elephants. And then there were antelope snares that were removed. Another secret here was that I motivated my students by saying that I would offer them free drinks if for every single snare that was found. Uh, at this point, they said, okay, no more free drinks. We can't take it anymore because lots of snares were being found. Our hit rate was significantly higher uh, than the traditional base hit rate, and this is uh, in our papers. So this improved confidence in our partners that machine learning was, in fact, guiding them to the right spots to find traps. But there's one possible criticism here that this is Uganda. If you go to a place where they haven't been patrolling for a while, you're going to find snares. To counter this criticism, we did a six-month experiment in two different national parks in Uganda, with Queen Elizabeth and Murchison Falls. We selected 24 areas. We designated our model, predicted some of them to be high-risk areas where we are going to find snares, and some to be low-risk areas where there's not going to be many snares found. These are all areas that were patrolled infrequently. And then we sent patrollers out without telling them which area was designated as what. They came back, and what we find is that when our model predicted to be a high-risk area, indeed more traps or snares were found, significantly more compared to those which we designated as low-risk areas. In Murchison Falls, it was high, medium, and low, and again, our predictions came out to be true. So this has really improved confidence in our partners that this technology is really working. But it is my belief that we have to continue to push and deploy these algorithms continually in the field to try to improve it. And so today, we are working with, in Cambodia with World Wildlife Fund, we have deployed our algorithms in the Sripak National Park, again making predictions of where uh, we would find snares. Uh, these are our predictions. I'm putting them here in the slide. If uh, I know there's a video recording later on, somebody can come and check whether we are right or wrong. But here's, today, results are starting to pour in. And indeed, they're finding snares in areas where we designated. So you can see the motorcycles are the ones the rangers use to patrol. And you can see large numbers of snares that are being found and removed, potentially saving lives of animals. So I've talked to you so far about this pipeline of data collection to prediction to prescription to field deployment. But predictions are based on what we have in terms of historical ground truth. I'm now going to talk to you about some recent work we've done to integrate real-time information. This is work that we have gone, uh, that we've been doing in Botswana with our collaborators, Air Shepherd. So we go to a different continent, and they fly these drones late at night and use infrared video to try to find poachers. The infrared video is being back to a van which is waiting, and there's a human being with, us, with some rudimentary uh, technology that they have to try to locate poachers in this infrared video. And you can see that this is not easy. To assist them, we've built a deep learning-based uh, system that will try to identify poachers in these videos, poachers and animals, and this is significantly more effective compared to their approach. So this is being de deployed in Botswana to try to locate poachers and animals. So the way this is working is that the drone will fly, it will locate poachers, and then we'll call in rangers to try to intercept them. So this is how it's supposed to work. The drone will fly, find poachers, alert rangers to come in. Unfortunately, there's not enough ranger resources to go around. In fact, we may have designated ourselves that the ranger be there with a probability of 0.3 using our game theory software. And so, in fact, for a large number of cases, the poachers may not be stopped. What to do in this case? So, Air Shepherd has come up with this idea that when there is no ranger, they'll do deceptive signaling. They'll turn on the light of the drone and fly low to warn the poacher that there is a ranger coming when in fact there is no ranger coming. And they find that the poachers actually run away when this happens. 
Now, this is deceptive signaling, but of course, if you always turn on the light and signal to the poacher that a ranger is coming when nobody is coming, they'll figure this out. So we must be strategic in our deceptive signaling. And this strategic signaling is part of the PhD work of my former PhD student, Haifeng Shu. He developed this new model of Stackelberg security games with optimal deceptive signaling. The key is here is to exploit the informational advantage. The defender not only knows the mixed strategy, but also knows the pure strategy, whether the ranger is actually present or not. So for those cases with the 0.3 probability when a ranger is present, when a drone flies, it actually knows whether the ranger is present. And in that case, we are going to honestly tell the poacher, hey, there's a ranger coming. Now, in the other cases, when there is no ranger, when the drone knows there is no ranger, there's still a 0.3 probability that we are going to use to alert the poachers that there is a ranger coming, deceptively. These probabilities are arranged in such a way that it is in the poacher's best interest to run away, even if they know that the defender is lying 50% of the time. So the poachers know there's deception going on, but it is still in their best interest to run away. And of course, then we complete, uh, in, in the remaining probability, we send no signal, honestly telling them there is no ranger coming. Interestingly, surprisingly, we can show that this strategic signaling actually reduces the computational computa uh, complexity of equilibrium computation. This is work that we are trying to now also push out into the field. So with all of this progress, with the pause software for predicting where poachers may set traps, with the spot software for detecting poachers late at night from infrared video, and so forth, the advances made over that, we have uh, now established a partnership with uh, SMART. This is a consortium of different wildlife conservation organizations, WWF, WCS, and others, and with Microsoft's AI for Earth, to make this, this software available worldwide to 600 national parks around the world. So this is work that's ongoing, and we hope to have this work deployed this year in 2019, making this software part of the package that goes out from SMART to all, to all these different parks. And so we expect to start getting back data from all these different parks, and we would be absolutely thrilled if anybody is interested to collaborate with them. And next up then is to try to extend this work towards stopping illegal fishing and illegal, forest, uh, illegal logging in forests. With this now, let me turn to the final part of my presentation, which is public health. Here I'll emphasize games against nature, and this is work done with my colleague and friend, Professor Eric Rice of Social Work. In Los Angeles, one big challenge we face is the large population of people. Um, in fact, we have 6,000 homeless youth who are sleeping on our streets every night. One big challenge is preventing HIV amongst these youth. The rates of HIV amongst the homeless youth are 10 times the rate of normal housed population. Homeless shelters try to spread information about HIV by informing peer leaders, educating them, and having them educate others in their community about dangers of HIV. So they're harnessing the social networks of this youth, but this is not Facebook. This is actually just regular face-to-face -face network because these homeless youth don't have access to computers and so forth. So this is really a problem of influence maximization. We have a social network graph G. We're trying to choose K peer leader nodes in order to have them spread information, maximizing the expected number of influence nodes here, meaning nodes that know about HIV and HIV testing. And we assume information spreads in the independent cascade model. So for example, if a youth A is informed about HIV testing, there's a 0.4 probability that youth B, who's adjacent to youth A, will be informed about HIV testing. Immersion in this domain, though, informed us that uh, these probabilities are very difficult to find. So if you inform youth C, what is the probability that youth D will be informed about HIV testing? We model this uncertainty by sampling it from a distribution. And in fact, to further model this uncertainty, we suggest that the mean of this distribution may itself be not known and is modeled as to lie within some interval. 
So how to do influence maximization to spread information about HIV when there is uncertainty in the spread of information? We model this problem as a game against nature where the, our algorithm is trying to choose a policy, choosing peer leaders to spread information, and nature is trying to choose parameter values for distribution in order to get our algorithm to perform as worse as possible where the payoff is the ratio of performance of our algorithm to the optimal for that setting. It's kind of a regret that we are trying to model. So this is the game. We are trying to choose along the rows different peer leaders, different nodes in the graph who we will inform about HIV. And nature is trying to choose parameter settings for spread of information to get our regret to be as high as possible. This is, of course, a very large-scale game because we have a large number of peer leaders we could select, and nature could, again, select parameters from a continuous range. But we know how to solve these large-scale games using incremental strategy generation, as we've seen before in the earlier part of the talk, and that's what we use here. So we are going to use an influencer oracle that will add the next best pure strategy, next best set of peer leaders, and in fact, since nature strategy space is also large, we can use in nature's oracle to incrementally add nature strategies. And we iterate in this fashion, this is a double oracle algorithm that can converge without exploring all of the different strategies, just like we've seen before. Even though nature is sampling from a continuous space, we can show that we converge with approximation guarantees in this case. So, that was one challenge. The next one is that our homeless shelters may not have the uh, capacity to educate all of the peer leaders that we select. We may want to educate 12 peer leaders, but in fact, we could only bring in four at a time. So we try to bring in four homeless youth to educate them about HIV, but one person may get arrested. Someone else may show up in their place, which means that next time we bring in the next four youth, we need to be aware of who it was that showed up in the first time step. So this is a problem of dynamic influence maximization. We are selecting peer leaders based on what happened before. In fact, we are generating a policy based on past observations. And so here we have a game where along the rows are the policies. These are essentially PalmDP policies. This is work of my PhD student, Amulya Yadav, who showed how these PalmDP policies can be generated efficiently by exploiting communities, because these homeless youth have different communities, so we can partition the graphs and generate these policies effectively. So we call this algorithm HEALER, also an acronym, and to test healer in the field, we ran experiments in different homeless shelters. So these are pilot tests. We ran two different versions of healer, and degree centrality was the baseline. This is the traditional approach, bringing in the most popular youth in order to spread information about HIV. We recruited 60 homeless youth, trying to keep conditions as identical as possible. We, were, we recruited 12 peer leaders in each case. Our colleagues in social work informed uh, the homeless youth who were called in about HIV educated them to have them spread this information. And the question is, which method would be more effective in spreading information? In fact, what we find is that our healer algorithms are far more effective in spreading information. 75% of the non-peer leaders, the people who we did not bring in, got informed about HIV when using our approaches. With the baseline approach of calling in the most popular youth, only 25% of the non-peer leaders got informed. So these algorithms are far more effective in spreading information, but the youth who got this information, do they actually start testing for HIV? And so we also looked at that and found that 30 to 40% of the youth who got informed actually started testing for HIV in our case, and no one in the case of the degree centrality, the traditional approach, because of course, the amount of people who got informed is also small. So this has given us confidence that this approach can be applied in many different places. But one challenge we faced as we started talking to other homeless shelters, trying to spread this to other states, uh, to go to San Francisco or New York and so forth, is that the first step is to collect data on the social network to find out which homeless youth is connected to who. And this is done by a survey that a social worker has to do in the homeless shelter or do field observations to find the social networks, even if uncertain. 
to try to reduce this burden, the question is, could we sample 18% or 20% of the network? And even with that, generate the right kind of peer leaders. In a AAAI 18 paper, we showed that we can do this sampling by sampling from the largest communities. And now with the sampling algorithm, we ran a new experiment. We recruited 60 homeless youth in Los Angeles, but this time we used the sampling algorithm to sample a small fraction of the network. And the question is, could our identification of peer leaders be effective even if we only sample 20% of the network. And indeed, we find that if we compare our sampling approach to the best Thieler algorithm to degree centrality, the sampling algorithm performed just as well in the real world in informing people and getting homeless youth tested for HIV. So the sampling algorithm uh, is turning out to be quite effective. And this, in general, has made our partners very happy in, in terms of being able to see the spread of this work to other parts of the United States. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. So in the last five minutes, uh, so, uh, we are continuing this work. We've completed a study of 900 youth at three different homeless shelters in Los Angeles. We hope to be publishing these results this year. In the last five minutes, I wanted to talk about research that we have begun to optimize the use of limited intervention resources in preventing tuberculosis in India. And this is work done in collaboration with Microsoft Research India and Everwell, which is an NGO that has come out of Microsoft. Tuberculosis is responsible for half a million deaths in India per year. So the challenge for health services is to ensure that patients adhere to prescribed courses of TB medicine. However many months, people have to keep taking their medicine. So Microsoft Research has this, uh, and Everwell have come up with this idea, where patients call a, cell, a particular number, on, which is printed on pill patches to better track adherence. So people are calling in to say, I took, a medicine, I took my medicine today, I took my medicine today, and so forth. The question is, could we predict patient adherence risk based on the call pattern? If we could do that, then we could intervene on those patients that are high risk of dropout and get them to continue taking the medicine. So consider here four cases. One, the first person has called the three, all three days. Second person has called only two of the days, missing one. And you can see, so the question is, which of these can we predict would drop out. If we could say that the two middle ones are the high risk ones who may drop out of treatment and intervene on them, then we could ensure that they are there. We have data today from the state of Maharashtra, and again, we are going through this data pipeline and using LSTMs trying to predict who are the high risk patients. Of course, we can, game theory comes in here because we want to be robust in our prediction of high risk patients. So you could imagine again that we are trying to predict high risk patients, but nature is trying to adversarially perturb these examples, introducing noise in order to get us to get our prediction to perform as worse as possible. Solving this game then gives us a mixed strategy over different predictors, probabilities with which we'll play these different LSTMs. And with this resulting mixed strategy, then we can make a more robust prediction. This is work that is ongoing. Uh, we are trying to push this forward. Initial results are very promising. 35% improvement over Everwell's baseline in terms of predicting true positive, meaning those who may drop out, and lowering the rate of false positives of high risk. We're trying to see if in collaboration with Microsoft Research India and Everwell, we would be able to integrate our software into theirs so that we will be more effective in predicting high-risk patients, potentially getting interventions on them, potentially reducing deaths uh, due to TB. So I've outlined just two of the projects that we have ongoing. There are many more. In Antelope Valley, which is just north of Los Angeles, we have a challenge of a low-resource community where youth are not eating in a healthy way. There's big incidence of obesity and diabetes. Harnessing the social networks in these communities, we are trying to reduce, in collaboration with our USC School of Medicine, incidence of obesity and diabetes. 
We are also trying to prevent suicide amongst vulnerable communities by engaging in more effective gatekeeper training, again harnessing the social network. The mayor of Los Angeles had recently visited USC and talked about the moral and the humanitarian crisis we face in Los Angeles with our vulnerable communities and our home, large homeless population. As an Angelino, I'm really honored and very grateful that with artificial intelligence, we can contribute back to Los Angeles, the city and the county. On the other side of the world, as a Mumbaiker, I was very honored to get to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Chief Minister of Maharashtra, uh, in, with the government of Maharashtra in the presence of the Chief Minister, to use AI for societal benefit. Having grown up in Mumbai, I and when I left Mumbai to do my PhD in Pittsburgh, I never thought this day would arrive. But thanks to the great progress that our community has made, I'm very grateful that we will now have an opportunity to contribute back to Mumbai, to Maharashtra, and and to other parts of India. And I have convinced several of my colleagues to regularly visit with me. Uh, and so I would be delighted if anybody here uh, is interested in collaborating with us to push this research forward. I talked about uh, predicting tuberculosis uh, treatment where people may not adhere, but we're also working on many other challenges. With Vadwani AI Institute, it is trying to do active tracing of TB patients. Uh, we are looking at how to allocate resources effectively in the fight against TB in our AAAI 18 paper, and many other challenges such as forming self-help groups in slums and so on. So this brings me to the very end of my presentation. I talked about directing AI and multi-agent systems research towards societal benefit. I talked about three areas, public safety and security, conservation and public health. There's a shared multi-agent research challenge that cuts across these areas, how to optimize the use of limited intervention resources. And I discussed solution approaches based on computational game theory. I introduced new models such as the Stackelberg security game, green security game, and introduced new algorithms, incremental strategy generation, marginals, double oracle, and so on. Throughout, I discussed this pipeline of data collection to prediction to prescription to field deployment. Typically, when we see this pipeline, we think about optimizing this prediction model independent of what's to come next. We just want to get the predictive approach to be as accurate as possible. But in our AAAI 19 paper, we show that this may not be the right approach. The predictive model should be informed of what's to come next. And in fact, the model that's more accurate according to traditional metrics of accuracy may not be the best one to use. And so how to tweak this predictive model using what is to come next in the pipeline? This is what we explore in our AAAI 19 paper. So with this, looking into the future, I see tremendous potential for AI in improving our society and fighting social injustice. But to make this happen, it is our responsibility as an AI community to bring AI to those who have not benefited from it. For example, to the Global South. And the Global South is not just a geographical region. There's Global South in the homeless youth in Los Angeles as well. And we have to embrace interdisciplinary research, working with social workers and conservation scientists and so on. Finally, when we discuss AI for societal benefit, it is important to step out of the lab and get into the field. This immersion is important because we want to understand what's the right kind of problems to solve. We want to understand what are the key weaknesses in our models. And I ask for those of you interested in applying AI for societal benefit to go out in the field and look at the problems that are all around you. So that's it, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening. Yeah, so thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, first in the context of the conservation effort, uh, and more broadly, so in the context of conservation, did you feel the need to model like human factors like collusion between whatever the rangers and the uh, poachers? Uh, and broadly, uh, do you f uh, see the need to kind of, uh, do you feel that insights from psychology, behavioral science could help you improve your algorithms further?
Yes, um, in fact, we've uh, tried to pursue a lot of uh, behavioral game theory work, trying to improve our models. And so this is something um, very important. I want to say that, you know, by no means is this work complete. There's tremendous room for improvement. These are massive societal challenges. Uh, we can contribute, but there's so much more to be done. And so, with respect to collusion uh, amongst rangers and poachers, for example, uh, you could imagine that the rangers may call up the poachers, hey, we are going to this side today to patrol. It's free over here, you can go attack this side. So t we have been trying to figure out how to stop that. And so the idea there is to over-randomize the patrols uh, so that even though you know, it, may, it may appear that they're going north, suddenly there's like a, a sharp turn south or something like that. And so these are things that we are exploring, but it's a, it's a, it's a massive problem uh, in terms of dealing with uh, possible collusion and how to, how to handle that. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots that needs to be done. Uh, but, um, but thank you for that question, yeah. Uh, Hello, so, I guess there are a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, we might have to stop. Uh, okay. We're really That's uh, fine. You know, on a tight schedule. But I think Milind is around today, uh, right? So, please feel free to interact with him in the, in the breaks. Uh, I would like to invite Lipika the, to hand over a small token of appreciation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a very quick announcement. Actually, I wanted to make sure that uh, the um, session chairs for the parallel sessions are here. Saurangshu, Saurangshu here, or Sushmita Ghosh. Can you raise it? Okay. Uh, and uh, Niyati, I think, is here. Okay. So if you can make sure that uh, the speakers have their, have their talks ready and maybe you can collect them in a a pen drive or something, it would really help because the schedule is very tight. So as I said, we really need the 30 minutes, uh, the coffee break to partition this room. Uh, and yeah. Hi, so an important logistic announcement. This is going to be the regular drill. So coffee is outside. I'll request everyone to troop out like in an emergency. It's not an emergency, but please go get your coffee. Unlike an emergency, take your stuff. Don't leave anything behind in this hall, okay? And there's going to be a really complicated logistics maneuver that's going to happen here. We'll be back here hopefully in half an hour. Okay? Session chairs, please stay here. Presenters for the next session, please stay here.